Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Woolley, uh, President and CEO of Research America. Welcome to today's Alliance member meeting, and thank you for being members of the Research America Alliance. Since we're using Zoom's webinar format today, all audience members are on mute for now, but I encourage you to use the electronic raise hand feature at the end of the discussion um, with Dr. Larry Tabak, who I'll so shortly introduce, and we'll unmute your line also for a verbal question if you do that, or you can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Now, as I mentioned, our guest today is Dr. Larry Tabak, Principal, Deputy Director of the National Institutes of Health. Those of us who have been joining our Alliance meetings uh, over the course of the last six months will remember that just about exactly six months ago today, Dr. Tabak was with us and we talked about what to expect going forward um, as we all faced uh, a lockdown and um, the sequelae. Of course, nobody really knew what it would feel like six months from then. Um, and nobody really knows what it's going to feel like six months from now. But if there's anybody who um, has his finger on the pulse of today and tomorrow, and this is a significant couple of days, it's Larry Tabak. So Larry, thank you so much for joining us to discuss how NIH is addressing the current funding situation and all the requirements and expectations around it um, due to COVID-19 and um, other parts of the very broad um, NIH agenda and to talk to us about the outlook for uh, fiscal 21. Thank you and all over to you. Well, thanks very much, Mary, um, and it's really a, a great privilege and, and pleasure to be with you today. Um, I, I think my um, bottom line message to, to, to everybody on the call today is that NIH remains deeply concerned for the health and safety of folks who are involved in NIH research. And obviously that includes the participants, that includes the the staff who, who are conducting the research um, and so forth. Um, and, and so, you know, we will continue to do our part. I think the, again, the sort of most important thing I can say is that we will continue to be as flexible as we possibly can be. Um, because when you have encountered one situation, you've encountered one situation, and, and this repeats itself over and over again. Um, we do have uh, updated information on the extramural website. I'm sure the listeners are uh, familiar with that, and we certainly would want to encourage everybody to continue to interrogate that um, on a frequent basis because things are so fluid. Um, obviously, we're in the last day of the fiscal year, and hopefully the continuing resolution passes and we will have uh, the, next, the beginning of the next fiscal year uh, tomorrow. Um, you, throughout the last six months or so, um, you know, we've been open for business. Um, virtually all of our extramural staff have worked remotely. 100% of the time. Um, the peer review meetings have been conducted um, virtually. Um, and I must say, um, in, in an in almost flawless um, manner, um, we are continuing to process applications and make awards. As of the June deadline, we are receiving and reviewing more applications then in times past, and we're processing more awards, uh, which I, I think speaks so highly of the commitment of our research community to, to, to be able not only to sustain what, what they've done in the past, but to actually exceed it. it, it it's absolutely remarkable when you, when you think about it. Um, we are trying to provide um, a series of funding opportunity announcements 
to support research related directly to COVID-19. And again, um, you can uh, interrogate the specific uh, funding opportunity announcements. There are 19 of them now, they're either extant or, or expired um, in the grants guide. Um, in October, um, we are going to be issuing a survey uh, for extramural scientists and extramural uh, administrators. And we hope that people will participate because it will inform our approach uh, in the months to come. I, I, again, I'm sure you all appreciate that the plural of anecdote is not data. And so we really wanna be able to you know, gather as much direct information as possible. Again, just to reiterate, we're gonna try and be as flexible as we can going forward. Um, we, we do have to work within both OMB and DHHS guidance. Um, and so, uh, you know, in that regard, uh, there, there, are, there are certain frameworks that we, we need to, um, you know, adhere to. Um, but um, some of the institutes and centers have extended deadlines for select funding opportunity announcements. Um, the other funding opportunity announcements, we are taking a very flexible stance um, submitted within a, you know, a standard two week late policy. Um, I think in terms of human subjects research, which is, has some unique attributes in terms of how it's been affected by the pandemic, obviously, you know, the first and foremost thing is to ensure the safety of both the participants and the staff involved in, in any human subjects uh, study, including trials, of course. Um, we, of course, we, we certainly urge consultation with IRBs and institutions about, you know, the appropriate protective measures such as and, and this is not, you know, inclusive, but, you know, it, for example, you know, limiting study visits to those needed for participant safety or coincident with clinical care, um, conducting virtual study visits, um, taking advantage of any potential flexibilities that one could have for required lab tests or imaging that are needed uh, for safety monitoring. And, um, and we'll, we'll continue to be flexible in terms of project extensions and accommodating unanticipated costs. Now, again, a lot of that is you know, done grant by grant. And I, I know people would prefer the metaphorical magic wand <laughs> where you just do everything all at once. But, but you know, working within our authorities, you know, we, we do have quite a bit of a leeway um, on, a, on a grant by grant basis. So, we um, have extensions for early stage investigators. We are very, very concerned about our early stage investigators and our trainees. Um, none of us uh, want to lose a generation of investigators. And, and so we know that early stage investigators and trainees um, probably have a unique set of um, issues over and above what many people are dealing with. Um, I, I know that, you know, those who have um, uh, either child or elder care responsibilities are facing all sorts of unique circumstances um, and, and being able to juggle, um, you, you know, your responsibilities to your family together with your professional responsibilities. I mean, you can only run so many Zoom calls at once. Um, actually, as I'm speaking, my wife is conducting a class <laughs> by Zoom in, in, the, in the other room. Um, and so, um, and, and, we're, and we're the lucky ones because we don't have little kids, you know, running around. So, so I think, um, you know, we understand all of this. And so we're going to continue to be as flexible as we possibly can. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I hope, you know, people will work with us um, to provide us with the circumstances and specifics um, because our, you know, our general policies do give us quite a bit of flexibility 
albeit on a you know on a case by case basis and and we we you know have been and will continue to you know work work through those um so let let me stop there um hopefully that provides at least a high overview of some of the things we've been trying to do thinking you know have been thinking about and so forth and turn it over to uh to the participants who i'm sure will have a number of very interesting questions today thank you uh very much larry and of course there are questions i want to start with one you know we're going into um a cr uh federal funding year now, which we've been there before many times, of course, and it's um, typical in a CR that NIH and for that matter, other agencies will hold back some funding um, to kind of see how the, until they, it's a little clearer how that year is going to be playing out. Is that the case coming up? Uh, have you been planning that way? Yeah, we, we really are obligated to do that as, as you, you know, no doubt have surmised um, and we will need to balance that type of planning with the um, you know real everyday issues that people are facing um, none of us know what will happen over the next several months or half year or even year um, and so we we need to I think be even a little more prudent than usual um, but, but again, emphasizing flexibility to ensure that, that our, you know, biomedical research team is, is able to navigate through, um, you know, what are obviously extraordinary challenges. Um, but yes, we, we, we do do that and, and we'll, we'll have to be a little bit more prudent, at least initially until the, you know, things uh, settle out a little bit so that we understand what what the future may hold. I'm just going to ask you a different kind of question before we turn to, as I'm sure uh, our Alliance members have questions. So I was struck by your point about um, doing peer review uh, reviews now remotely in essentially flawless, I think was your word, uh, ways. I wonder whether that's one of those silver lining aspects that um, it might be something to do going forward on a routine basis, saves a lot of money in travel costs, uh, might make it possible for some people who would like to participate but can't afford the time when, when you consider travel and so forth. Have you thought about that already or is it just on the list of many things to consider? Um, we actually have had several discussions about this already. Um, and it, it falls under the general rubric of you know, lessons learned. Um, and and you, you've outlined um, some very positive attributes of conducting peer review in this way. I think the other uh, uh, dimension of this is, is that many institutions around the country, because of the challenges that they face, really do not want to allow their faculty to travel yeah. Um, yeah. They would really like them to remain close to home, but most are quite amenable to having their faculty participate um, in a virtual way um, where the amount of time obviously is, is, is much less than if we're, right. you know, getting on a plane and, and so forth. Right. Right. So I think we will, along with many other things in terms of process, uh, have to do a thorough uh, evaluation and analysis and keep the good parts and get rid of forever, we hope, some of the parts that were not so good. Um, and I'm sure we all have a list of those. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, you're quite right. Um, this, the, 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 um, the, the ability to conduct review in this manner I think has surprised a lot of people and, uh, and, and, you know, one could envision those resources, at least a portion of them, uh, you know, being, being used for other, you know, other purposes in the support of science. So, uh, yes, that's a very important point. And, and there will be no doubt other lessons that we will 
gleaned from, you know, what has obviously been a, a, a challenging set of circumstances. Well, I'm, I'm sure you are keeping a list and it sounds like you're encouraging others to do the same. So that's great. That's great, Larry. Um, so I'm, Terry, I'm going to turn to you because I understand we have some questions from our uh, Alliance members. Yes, we certainly do. Um, the first one's a long one, but I think it gets at uh, what Dr. Tabak was discussing about sort of the real world of what's actually happening. Um, the example is someone has two R01 grants coming up for renewal, went to no cost extension uh, due to the shutdown, was able to still continue to pay students and postdocs and other salaries, continued to pay full price for animal housing. When we began to open up four months later, the money was spent, but the research to get the preliminary data for the renewals had not been done. We appreciate grant deadline extensions, but what we need is funded grant extensions. We have heard that such are available, but how does one apply for them? To whom, how, and when? So, well, I mean, that's a, that's a very important question, a very practical one. Um, and again, at the moment, institutes and centers will have to make a case-by-case -case decision on how best to deploy the resources that that they are you know appropriated um as you i'm sure all know there there has been discussion about um whether or not there will be additional resources provided to nih um to help um the phrase used is you know make the extramural community whole um and um we we you know i, I suspect you all know as much as i do about you know whether whether that will happen and if so when and and so forth um but ultimately um we you know are entrusted with with an appropriation on a you know institute or center basis and institutes and centers will have to decide um how best to to navigate this um because obviously it's a finite resource set and so do you, you provide, do you provide additional resources to the individual who, who posed the question or, or do you fund somebody's first R01 grant? Um, and, and I hate to be so black and white about it, but you know, ultimately it'll, you know, we'll come to decisions like that. And, and hopefully, you know, we will be able to make really, uh, uh, you know, good judgments based upon the facts in the, in the various uh, cases. Um, and that's why I keep emphasizing the need for flexibility and the need for the community to continue to work with us so that we have the information that we will need, um, you know, to, to make what we hope are the very best decisions. Great, thank you. Um, are there ways in which you think scientific societies can help with the challenges NIH is facing regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the biomedical research enterprise? Well, in so many ways, <laughs> um, uh, because obviously um, the societies are, are an important source of recommendations for things like peer review panels. Um, they are an important source of information um, to um, policymakers um, throughout, you know, the, the, the country. Um, and, um, you know, and, and obviously as part of the executive branch, um, you know, we, we can um, address certain things, but not others. And, and so professional organizations, professional societies, um, you know, regardless of what, what their views are, uh, you know, should be expressing them. Um, also, when we do uh, issue this survey, we hope professional societies will um, um, certainly um, recommend to their membership participation so that we get as clear a picture as possible um, of, of what's really happening on the ground. I mean, we can impute from what we've seen in the intramural program, we can impute from what we hear about, you know, with investigators contacting us. But, but again, we'd like to have as broad a, a, a set of data as possible so that, again, we, we are most well-informed and can, and can make best decisions possible. 
actually that uh, leads into another question. Uh, several people have typed in that they'd like to hear more about this survey. Um, is it intended to help understand the state of extramural research and types of challenges faced? What other feedback tools and processes has NIH used to take the pulse of research during the pandemic? Yeah, so, um, so with regard to the first piece, yes. So this is to designed to get feedback about what the pandemic has done in terms of your research um, efforts. Um, and again, our program officers have been in very um, close communication with many of their uh, grantees. And so we, ha we have been collecting a fair amount of you know, informal feedback, if you will. We have also surveyed our own workforce of both scientific and non-scientific and to the extent that there are similarities, um, you know, we are gaining, you know, some insights there as well. But but obviously, um, there are unique attributes um, within the extramural community. And again, as as you all know better than I, each institution has its own business model, and depending upon the business model that they employ that could have a very dramatic difference in, in how the pandemic and the collateral circumstances have um, in, you know, affected you. Um, and so we need, we need to understand that. We need to you know, know that. Um, and so uh, we, we do hope that, that folks will you know, take, take the time to, to help us out and, and get a, you know, a broader set of, of information. And as I said, that'll be coming uh, in October sometime, so stay tuned. Great, thank you so much. Another question, uh, with regards to COVID-19 related research concepts, uh, what is the time frame from when institutes request input from the scientific community and when those concepts are actually actualized into funding opportunities such as RFAs, program announcements, uh, notices of special interest? Yeah. Um, I would say that um, it's been extremely rapid. Um, the first tranche of FOAs went out, you know, within a couple of months of things um, emerging. Um, so I, I'm going to put on my other hat, which I can only wear for a little while longer. Um, I, I currently have the privilege of serving as the acting director of the uh, Dental Institute. Um, and, and so we we uh, just just by way of example, we we had a stakeholders meeting, um, four or five of the largest professional organizations uh, in in dental sciences, and um, based upon that feedback, we turned that into both um, NOCES as well as FOAs. Um, you know, within within a couple of months. Um, and I think, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I know the same has occurred, you know, with, with some of the other institutes. Now, in terms of efforts, you know, to develop vaccines and therapeutic interventions and so forth, uh, those have been proceeding at lightning speed. Now, obviously, there's, there's much more to be done. Um, and, and, and so we're now sort of seeing the second or third wave, depending upon the institute, some got out much quicker than others, you know, second or third wave of, of opportunities. So um, this is, uh, you know, we understand we're in an emergency. Uh, this is not business as usual. And we have, we have moved uh, a number of things very quickly um, because of the need for therapeutics, the need for diagnostics, the need for uh, vaccines, obviously. Uh, again, just putting on the other hat just for a second, the Dental Institute, we, we, we needed to support some fundamental research on how you would want to change practice of dentistry in the community. Uh, <laughs> it, it, if any of you have had to go to a dentist, it, it looks different now uh, and for good reason. And some of that is being informed by, by the work that, that, that the NIDCR has supported. Um, and, and again, each institute and center has its own unique stakeholder groups that, that they need to be attentive to. So I would say we're, we are moving things uh, rather rapidly. 
and we'll and we'll need to continue to do so. Um, and um, you know, we 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 have been so fortunate in receiving unprecedented support from the Congress um, in terms of some supplementals, which you're all familiar with, and, and that has helped enormously. Um, and um, you know, we we are we are of course very grateful for the you know for the confidence that they show to us by providing those extra you know additional resources. Great, and that leads me to a two-part question that I think follows up a little bit on that. First, um, of the increased numbers of applications you're receiving, uh, what percentage are COVID-19 related? And then on a similar note, how is the NIH balancing its normal research portfolio in contrast to the demand for COVID-related research? Is this COVID research being funded more strictly with the CARE supplemental funding? Um, so I think in terms of absolute dollars, um, because of the magnitude of some of the supplemental funding, um, obviously a great deal of COVID related research has been, has been, um, awarded uh, again with, with, you know, great thanks to the, to the Congress. Um, I think beyond the supplemental individual institutes and centers have been, uh, funding COVID related research. Um, we, we are obligated to prioritize, um, you know, what is the most important, um, opportunity. And when you're facing a public health emergency, um, that comes right to the top of the list, whether, you know, your particular institute or center received a supplemental or not, um, public health emergency rises to the top. Um, within the intramural program, um, I can tell you most of the laboratories um, on a dime turn to COVID-related work. Um, and, and, and of course, that's an advantage of the intramural program. We can do that. Um, but similarly, um, you know, the you know, number of the institutes and centers that did not receive supplementals still knew they needed to, you know, support things that were quite important um, and, and have done that and will continue to do that. Now, the balance, I think, is going to be very institute and center specific. Um, I think you need to look at the portfolio across NIH, the portfolio of the individual institute or center, and, and what the current status is of this pandemic, which, as you know, remains fluid. Um, and now, as we see of those who have survived the initial infection and a subset um, are clearly still struggling, the so-called long haulers, that demands our attention. Um, you know, I, I, again, it's a public health emergency. So, so I, think, I think there will not be a single size fits all. Now, all that said, we, we are also very sensitive to the fact that um, other elements of people's health and well-being are, are also important. And, and whilst we had an initial dip in enrollment in various trials, for example, trials related to cancer, um, you know, we, we've got to get boost those up. And my understanding is those numbers have come up pretty, pretty well now. But, but each institute and center can, can point to, you know, similar issues. And so, as, as the, the questioner clearly understands, this is going to remain a balancing act um, informed by the scientific opportunity, informed by where we are um, in terms of the, the nature of the pandemic at that moment in time because of its fluidity, um, and, and informed by, um, you know, the other issues that a particular institute or center um, is responsible for, and and that's that's the balancing act that will that will continue, and we hope continue well informed by our colleagues in the extramural program. Well, uh, Larry, my team tells me that we're going to have to wrap up, but I I want to thank you and compliment you and all the people who are working with you at NIH to make hard decisions, as you've just pointed. Um, to be sure that we are 
uh, doing everything possible to realize the promise of science for health. And you can be assured on our side as advocates for uh, research um, generally and very much for NIH, we want to make sure that the NIH has all the resources possible to avoid things like robbing Peter to pay Paul, make sure that science can address all the many diseases, disabilities, need for prevention, and so much more um, that right now you have to triage. We understand that. Um, but ideally, we should be letting science deliver at the level it's capable. Um, so again, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for all you're doing, Larry, and for all your flexibility and understanding and support for the community. Um, and thank you for who have joined us, our Alliance members. I ask you to please mark your calendars for our next Alliance member meetings next week on Tuesday, October 7th at 11 Eastern time. We'll be hearing from Dr. Lou Garrison, Professor, Pharmaceutical Outcomes Research and Policy Program at the School of Pharmacy, at the University of Wisconsin, and Dr. Andres Inche, Independent Healthcare Pricing and Access Expert. Dr. Garrison and Dr. Inche will join us to discuss drug pricing policy, specifically the international reference pricing demonstration included in the recent executive order. Uh, we have more programs coming up on Thursday, October 15th, uh, 2.30 Eastern Time. We'll hear from Becky Williams, the acting director of clinicaltrials.gov at the NIH, and Anna Fine, deputy director at clinicaltrials.gov, about clinicaltrials.gov modernization. Uh, we look forward to those, seeing you at um, those programs and urge you, if you have a particular interest, some, someone, some activity you'd like to hear more about, please be in touch with us at Research America. Um, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Larry. Thank you. Bye now. Our best. <laughs>